Welcome, welcome, patrons! As many of you know, I often do theory videos, except I haven't done one in about six months. So what gives? What gives is that, one, if I have a theory, I often just talk about it in a video explaining an actual lore thing, so I don't really have any pet ones that we fit for just a video, because I usually talk about it anyway. Two, I don't want to make videos about other people's theories unless they come to me first, mostly because I don't have the time to chase cool theories around, I don't want to copy people's material. And three, I haven't really gotten any submissions on theories that are both long enough to make it worthwhile for a video and something that isn't super common. And here is where I feel really bad. I do get a lot of messages about theories, but most of them have been said many times over. I get a lot of repeat theories, and I can't make a video about your theory when that theory has been said by a bunch of other people. And I'm not saying that these people, like if, you, if this was if this was you, like you copied someone else's theory and slapped your name on it. I think these theories are just kind of uh, ob obvious, I guess, or, or very easy to come across. I don't mean to like, insult people's intelligence, but I, I get it a lot. But yeah, so to clear the air and hopefully to stop people sending me just pages and pages of stuff they've written for me just to reply, oh that's cool, I have, I've heard that before. I've decided to start a small series where I talk about super common theories that I hear a whole bunch of times. This is going to be just a quick review of these theories, so there'll be a couple holes here and there, but I don't want this video to be super long. While I don't believe in all of these, a lot of them are really good. So, let's talk about common theories. Common theories. So let's start off by going over Dragon Age Inquisition specific ones. Hawk doesn't die. Even though I talked about this in my video for Hawk, I still get this one a lot. <laughs> so for whatever reason, in Here Lies the Abyss, you chose for the Warden to survive and Hawk to distract the Nightmare Demon long enough for you to escape. And now, Hawk is trapped in the Fade. But, did they really die? The whole theory comes from this line from Flemeth. Before I go, a word of advice. We stand upon the precipice of change. The world fears the inevitable plummet into the abyss. Watch for that moment, and when it comes, do not hesitate to leap. It is only when you fall that you learn whether you can fly. What should I do? Do as I do. Become a dragon. <laughs> you could never be a dragon. Combine that with the fact that the quest in Inquisition is called Here Lies the Abyss, and the thing about change, well, it got fans thinking that perhaps this advice can somehow help Hawk. I've seen various thoughts on how they could have survived, some by turning into a dragon like Flemeth actually suggests, some by using an alluvian and somehow popping into the real world using Meryl's alluvian. Others say that the divine spirit comes back and helps Hawk, or that Justice and Anders, if they're dead or alive or who knows, are somehow helping them, etc, etc. There's a ton of different ways. Honestly, I have no secret knowledge here. It, it could happen. I. I don't know. Although I, I will say I don't really want it to. I feel like it, this makes the choice less meaningful. But I do think there are some nods that Hawk dies. For one, a Hawk and the Warden have the same death animation in the Fade. After you leave them, they just kind of like spaz out and fall over or wibble wobble, whatever. And second, the last codex entry for Harden Hightown in Trespasser. It's hinted that the spirits wrote this entry, and no matter who you leave in the Fade, it's about the lead character Donnan retiring somewhere, relaxing with a character that seems an awfully like the person you left behind, including Hawk. Granted, this could be the spirits playing on the Inquisitor's memory, giving them a peaceful image of their afterlife, but I also see it as a nod to the players from the devs that the person left behind has died, but is also at peace. But let's, let's just be honest here, more dead characters have come back to life, so really anything could happen. Solus and the Anchors slash Well of Sorrows. This is a two for one here, mostly because they kind of revolve around the same concept. So let's start with the Well of Sorrows because I also get messages for this a lot. When an Inquisitor or Morrigan drinks from the Well of Sorrows, they are bound to the will of Mithal, which functionally means that Flemeth can now literally control whoever drank from the well. But what happens when Solus sucks the energy from Flemeth? Does he now have the power of the well? 
Can he control Morrigan, the Inquisitor? And more importantly, does this mean the Sovellan romance got really weird and manipulative at the end there? The honest answer is, I don't know. We don't really know how the magic of the well works or if Solus now has Mithal's fragments. But I present to you this. Deep in the Code of Inquisition are designer notes from the devs. One of these notes says this. This is Flemeth from the previous two games. In this game, Flemeth's story comes to a head. She knew that Solus would summon her and that he would need to steal her power to further his plans. She knew that because they are both elven gods, yet Solus has slept for a thousand years and his power dwindled, while she was killed long ago and a spark escaped from her into the body she now holds. She has nurtured that spark and knew that Solus would need it. He was once her oldest friend, but she knows that in his drive to save the elven people, he will kill anyone, even her. She intends to let him have the power so long as she can pass the essence of her godhood onto Morrigan, a gift that Flemeth had always planned for her daughter, yet one Morrigan misunderstood as hostile possession. So that means Solus only took Flemeth's power, not really her godhood. I take that to mean that Morrigan, who has been called the inheritor from an old god baby Kieran, is going to need to take on the fragments of Mithal, which would give her powers over the well, and the Inquisitor if they drink. You can also ask Solus and Trespasser if he is like Mithal, which would have given the devs the perfect chance to say that he has the fragment of Mithal, but he just says no. It's not a great piece of evidence, I'll admit, as the context isn't quite right and Solus is all about that manipulating the context, but I feel like that also would have come up if he had Mithal. Granted, this is in the meta, so who knows if they change that or not, but for the moment I'm betting that this theory is false. Now for the second part, when Solus removes the anchor from you, does he actually take it for himself? Jakta actually has a whole video on this, so head over there if you want to hear more about it, but here's the basics. The whole thing is based on the animation for the scene where he actually takes the anchor from you, where people question the flashing of magic and wonder if Solus put the anchor on himself. This one I honestly don't believe in, mainly because of tweets from the devs, and I also have one critique on Jack's video here. In Jack's video, he mentions a Reddit post that talks about the theory and that it links to a tweet from Patrick Wheats that reads that Solus takes the anchor. Now, Jack is a goober. I'm gonna be very harsh with you, Jack. Uh, <laughs> he doesn't link the Reddit post. So there are so many that when I actually went looking for it, I couldn't find one that had linked that particular tweet from weeks in it. So I, I don't doubt that it exists. I just can't find it. And when I went looking for the tweet myself, I couldn't find any that used the word takes, but I did find a bunch that used the word removed. Also, a bunch answering that, yes, Solus removed your arm, the Inquisitor didn't have to cut it off, the animations are just a bit weird. But I think this theory forgets an important part in Inquisition. The anchor is permanent. You have spoilt it with your stumbling. It seems to stable the anchor so it wouldn't kill you, Solus made it permanent to you. Corypheus couldn't take it off, and I doubt Solus could either. Plus, if Solus's whole plan was to use the orb to make the anchor to go into the Fade, you would think that at least for a low improval Inquisitor, he would have taken the anchor, flipped him the bird, and walked into the Fade to finish what he started. But he doesn't do that, because I don't think he has the anchor. Solus is Shartan. This was actually a major theory leading up to the release of Trespasser DLC, mainly for this quote said by the spirit of Shartan in the Temple of Sacred Ashes. I'd neither a guest nor a trespasser be. In this place I belong, that belongs also to me. Of what do I speak? It was my dream for the people to have a home of their own, where we would have no masters but ourselves. The enemy of my enemy is my friend, and thus we followed Andraste against the Imperium. But she was betrayed, and so were we. Mix the word trespasser with both souls and Shartan are bald, and they had to be the same person, right? I mean, Kotaku even ran an article based on Geek Remix's video about it, which go watch Geek Remix's video about it. It's very good. <laughs> Mari may even be the person who originated this theory as a whole, although I was able to find some similar posts on different forums that kind of have a proto version of this a little before her video came out. Um, their posts may be based on Mari's Reddit post, but Reddit helpfully doesn't add exact dates, it just says three years ago. So that's really cool, and I don't know which came first, but either way it seems that this is kind of 
a more common theory, Mari just was the one to spearhead it. Anyway, I have one critique on Mari's video. Uh, I just want to throw this in here. At one point, she mentioned that Shartan is depicted holding an orb, but I don't think that's Shartan. I think that's Havard, the man who took her ashes from Tevinter to their final resting place in the Temple of Sacred Ashes, who is also bald, by the way. Also, as the story goes, Shartan was killed when he charged Andraste's pyre to free her, so him being alive after Andraste's death, or even just chilling around her pyre, wouldn't make much sense. Which, granted, this theory is about Shartan being soulless, so he wouldn't have died, but the art is made by the Chantry who believe that he did. So I don't think they would have shown him, but that's neither here or there. Anyway, the main evidence for this, as Mari states in her video, is visual based on Chantry drawings and stain art and whatever, and that more data mine notes mention that Solus only slept for a thousand years. But there is one more piece that came out after Mari's video in World of Thetis Volume 2. Elements appear very similar to ancient elven folklore about a rebellion against tyrants led by a trickster warrior, and it is hard to determine which parts are rooted in history and which in heroic myth. It is certain that slave rebellions across the Central Imperium were instrumental in the success of Andraste's campaign against Tevinter, but we cannot verify Shartan led any of them. Different versions of the canticle place Shartan's rebellion in Valdorma, Marnas Pell, Solus, Marathius, and Hasmal all cities that suffered significantly from the famine that struck the Imperium and were the sites of brutal slave uprisings. Some scholars suggest that if Shartan existed at all, the name was a title or an ideal. Perhaps every rebellion had a Shartan, and he was truly the leader of every group of elves. So Chantry scholars literally believe that Shartan could have been based on the tales of the Dread Wolf. But not only that, there could have been more than one Shartan, that it was a title, they even named the city of Solus as a place where one of the slave uprisings happened. All of this just stinks of Solus's presence. Attached to the theory that Solus is Shartan is that Shartan was led by Solus, that Shartan was an ancient elf that was one of Solus's spies. Unlike the other two theories, this one I think is more plausible. Solus's whole goal was to free the elves from slavery from the Evanuris, so naturally he would feel compelled to free them, again, from slavery. But this line of thinking also brings one critique from it. If Solus wanted to help these elves be free from slavery, does that mean he once saw Thetis' elves as his people? More than mere empty shells, like he does at the beginning of Inquisition, slash if your Inquisitor never befriended him? And if so, what changed in that 1000 years? And if nothing did, what compelled him to help the shadows of his people? Was it Andraste? Or something else? And that, your patrons, is all that I have on these common theories. Originally, I had planned to go over all the ones I could think of for this video, but it just became absolutely huge. So uh, expect these to just drop kind of randomly over the next few months. And tell me in the comments, what do you think of these series? Do you believe them? Not believe them? Have anything else to add? Something I missed? You have lingering questions? Proof that I'm wrong? Comments about your own fan theory? Feel free to tweet me at Gilderthon on Twitter. Send a PM to user Gilanon on Reddit. And to rest your all.